Hey everybody, this is Anne and welcome back to Painting Big Miniature Painting Fundamentals. Here we are. So today we're going to tackle a question I always get asked on my streams, which is brushes. What the heck? What's with these brushes? What should I use? What size should I use? What material? Oh my gosh, what is Kalinsky Sable anyway? All right, so we're going to talk about all of that. Let's get to it. Sweet, all right, I have a bunch of brushes here to show you. But first we are gonna be talking about material, all sorts of different materials. Let's get a little closer. Let's get a little closer and zoom in on our brushes. So we've got a bunch of different uh, shapes and sizes and uh, all sorts of stuff, different brands, oh my. Uh, the first question is really materials. So there's two different types of materials, like baseline materials that are gonna differentiate one brush from another. And that is, are you going to talk natural hair sable or various other hairs, or are you going to be talking synthetics? Now you can see that one of these synthetics is very cleverly disguised. It definitely looks like a natural sable, but when you look at the body of the brush, it does not in fact say sable or anything of the sort. And in fact, this brush is a synthetic. Um, whereas when you look at the other brushes, you can see they clearly say Kalinsky, which is a type of sable. It's in fact the top two grades of sable. We'll talk about that in a second. So these are all synthetic brushes and synths are a great way to get into the hobby. They are inexpensive. They are very suited if you are working with anything that's going to run through brushes or generally abuse it. Like if you're doing a lot of dry brushing, if you are working with oils, a synthetic brush can be absolutely your best choice uh, because the solvents that you're dealing with with oils on miniatures are going to be pretty hard on your brushes. So often people will choose to go in the direction of synthetic brushes for most of their oil painting. So the upsides of synthetics are that some of the best ones are actually really quite good. Um, they've got, as you can see, this brush has an excellent tip. It's, uh, it's got the shape that we like for miniature painting. It's, it's around, it's got a nice taper to it. It's a good size. It obviously you could use this to, to hit details. It's great. Um, and they're pricing, they're very inexpensive. So at most, usually you're gonna be paying five or six, uh, maybe seven bucks for a really good synthetic. Um, if you get a really crappy synthetic because you're doing a lot of terrain painting or you just want a big brush to cover a lot of ground quickly, you could be talking more like two or three bucks per brush. Either way, you can get some very inexpensive synthetic brushes out there. However, with brushes, be advised you do get what you pay for. So. What happens to synthetics over time is that they deform. So you can see these guys, see that little curl at the tip of the bristles there. See how these are kind of fluffed. This brush has just been abused. This is a terrain brush and this is a dry brushing brush. So you can see that I've abused them, but you can see that the hairs hook a little. Let's get even closer. So see those hairs kind of going out there, like kind of getting a little hook at the end. We call that hooking. These guys are fluffy right now, but they also are hooking outward. And this little brush you can see is just starting. See a little fuzzing at the tip, how the tip isn't as fine as you might have originally thought. See just that little deformation up there? That's the start of what will eventually become a hook. So because these are synthetic bristles, that means they're plastic, which means that they're not gonna wear as nicely as a natural hair bristle will. And so that's why you get that wear. This is just a sign that the plastic has gotten abraded uh, through doing, you know, being rubbed repeatedly against a surface and it, it gets soft and fuzzy and it hooks. So essentially the structure just breaks down. Whereas with a natural hair, that's just like really molecularly structured to kind of keep its shape as long as it's, uh, you know, conditioned well. So plus side price, you can find them easily. There are some really good, like, you know, relatively good ones out there on the market. Uh, downside is they will wear and they will wear a lot quicker than a natural hairbrush uh, because they are plastic. It depends really, your mileage with these is really gonna depend on how much you paint. If you don't paint very often, Honestly, like this one's got about uh, 10 hours in it, I'd say, about 10 hours of painting on it. It's only just starting to lose its excellent tip. So if you only paint like two hours a night and you only do it a couple times a week, it's gonna take you several weeks before you're really gonna notice uh, a downgrade in your synthetic brush. And maybe you go through, you know, like six or six or eight in a year, you know, and you're paying five bucks for brush, you know, okay. 
So maybe that's 30 to 40 bucks total per year to keep yourself in a really good miniature painting brush. You could also extend the life by getting a couple of these, using one mostly for base coating and just general stuff and keeping one in reserve for really small details like eyeballs and, uh, and buckles and things. And that of course will preserve your detail brush for longer. So that's synthetic. And I find that I do reach for synthetic with my oil painting because like I said, solvents can be hard on natural hairs. Um, and also if I want to do a lot of wet blending, a lot of, you know, kind of smooshing the paint together, I find it stands up to that pretty well. And of course the price point is good. Now let's talk about sables. Not all sables are created equal. Let's get the, another thing to, to tell you is that when your brush is dry, you can't really judge whether it's got a tip or not. If you're in an art store and you're shopping for sable brushes, always see if you can wet them down. If you have a bottle of water or something with you, um, because it's really when they're wet that you want to examine and make sure they've got a really good tip. And these guys do. So the first thing to know is that there are different grades of sable. Uh, not all sables are created equal. And most of the sables that we use for miniature painting are of the top two grades of red sable, which would be called Kalinsky. And when you have a Kalinsky brush, you're going to see that word showing up on the barrel. Now, Kalinsky sables do come with a hefty price tag. And sometimes some companies even have trouble importing them into the United States. There's a weird clause, I think, in Fish and Wildlife that that is like, it's an animal. And even though it's a nuisance animal and in, in uh, you know, it's still, still uh, sometimes you'll notice there, we go through periods of scarcity with Kalinsky sables here in the States. Um, anyway, so these are the top two grades of red sable, which means that they've got a really nice strength to them. They don't just go kind of fuzzy. They're not too soft. They've got a good firmness. They hold an excellent tip when they're well constructed. And essentially you're paying for all that, right? Now, can you just get a normal red sable of a lower grade and, and get lucky? Yeah, you can. Um, lower grade red sables tend to be softer. It tends to be harder to use them to apply details because they aren't as firm. They don't keep as firm a point um, and you're paying also for the hand construction and just like it's both construction and hair quality that leads to a brush with a, a good tip so really it's hard to tell the difference between a grade two and grade one uh, red sable it's pretty much anything you see in these sort of brushes is, is going to be pretty much top of the pack you may find yourself uh, migrating toward one brand or another almost everybody's got a favorite brand but before we talk about the differences between brands Let's talk about shapes. So obviously a couple of the brushes that I have here are flats and I find flats to be very useful for large subjects like dragons, um, for anything that involves dry brushing, for any large flat areas. If I was ever painting um, a, a mecha or anything like that, where I didn't, even if I didn't want to airbrush, then I would end up using a, a flat brush. Um, where these guys have uh, minimal application is when you're getting down into being smaller figures. So say you're working on a statue, like you're repainting like a video game statue, then using one of these guys to do your base coating and sometimes maybe even some light dry brushing would make a lot of sense. And like I said, terrain, these are really good for terrain. But when you get to miniatures, we tend to gravitate more toward the rounds, right? These are called the round brushes right here as obviously they are not flat, they are round. But you can also see there's a variety of different shapes here. Not every brand is shaped the same, and uh, there also are just different names for some of these. So let's put our synth aside and look at these guys. I'll take away Tiny Brush for now. We'll talk about him in sizes. So we've got a progression here that you can plainly see. We've got a very short, thick brush, right? You can see that that's a little bit shorter than the other two, and it's very much wider at the base here. Then you've got this kind of middle of the road brush, uh, and then you've got this really long, slim brush. Here's another example of a long, slim brush. Let's grab my Raphael. So we'll use several different, um, four different brands here. So this one, which is the Reaper, Reaper brand, uh, finest Kalinsky. This one I would call a standard round. It's got a fair belly on it. The belly is the thick part of the brush and it tapers nicely to it a point. This Optima, this Escoda um, Optimo Kalinsky is a thicker, shorter brush. And if you ever see a brush advertised as a miniature 
brush. For example, you might see uh, that Winsor & Newton has a uh, Kalinske Sable miniature brush line. That does not mean that it is for miniatures. It is a, the, it's, it's just to delineate the particular shape. And those miniature brushes are going to be wedge shaped. They're going to be that thick bottom, short bristle, which I think is why they call it a miniature, and a very fast taper to a tip. So what you may find with these is they carry more fluid um, and they, you can still do fine details with them, but you may find it harder to get them to do really fine stuff just because that tip is just a little bit, it's not as long and thin. And so precision is maybe a little harder with it. Then you've got these guys. Actually, this Da Vinci Maestro series 10, size one, is from their standard round line. They just tend to have a slightly longer, thinner brush in their particular line. And that's where we're gonna get into brands in a moment. But then we've got this one. This is a Raphael, size zero, Kolinsky. You notice these are also from all different countries. Um, this one is what they call a tapered round. Notice that it's got a wider belly down here, but that it tapers into this long, thin tip that's more like this brush. Now, you can really see that these are actually different shapes when you line them up in a row and you just cover up the bottom of them. You can still see the difference. Even there, you can see that the one on the left, the miniature series brush is very wide and wedge shaped, very triangular, that the standard round in the middle is getting more of a gradual taper toward the end, and that the thinner, um, more tapered, uh, fine pointed round at the right is very skinny, long and skinny at the end. And these make them good for different things. So before we talk about like what these are all good for, I want to talk really briefly about sizing because that's what you most of you guys are going to be watching this video for, right? So as you can see here, we have a bunch of different sizes. Um, all the ones that I've been showing you are between a zero and a two. Weirdly, the short fat one is the biggest number. That's a size two, that is a size one, that's a size zero, and this is a size zero. This little tiny baby that I'm holding, this is also a series 10 like its friend here, but it's a triple zero size. So you can see the difference in the triple zero versus the one in this particular line. When you look at a brush, by the way, and you see the brand and you'll see the line name and you'll see like Kalinsky, then you'll usually see a number. The number is the series. The series actually tells you whether the brush is a normal round or a pointed round or a miniature or any other shape that the particular, you know, I guess there are spotters and liners. And there's all sorts of other shapes. So we don't use that often in miniature painting. But so when you order, if somebody tells you, oh, order a Rosemary Company um, Zero, you know, ask them, okay, which series? Because the different series 33, series 23, all those are gonna have different shapes, different core shapes. And you're gonna wanna choose one that suits what you like to do. So what are these all good at? Okay, so the base thing to remember you guys is that obviously, right, the, the brush with the bigger belly is gonna hold more paint, right? You, you know that for sure. So these two brushes are gonna hold a lot more paint. What that means is that if you are like me and you like to use really thin paint to do fine detailing and layering and stuff like that, you know, blending, it's going to take you a long time using these to unload your brush because you're going to load your brush up with your super thin paint. There's going to be a ton of water. The brush is going to soak it up like a giant sponge. And then you're going to have to unload your brush a ton to get control. Otherwise, all that water is going to go right onto your miniature. Um, whereas with really thin paint, if you use a, a finer tapered brush, even if it's a bigger one down here, you can still load it up here and you won't get as much paint in your brush, but you, you won't have to unload it as much either. Downside is obviously not much paint held here. So if you try to use thicker paint with this brush, it will dry in these thin brushes faster. So thinner paint, thinner brush in general will give you less frustration. On the other hand, when you are using thicker paint, say you're using a wet palette and you use your paint like, you know, fairly thick, these bigger, thicker, fatter brushes are gonna be great because your thicker paint doesn't have as much water in it. So it's gonna be, you know, wanting to dry a little faster on the brush. Makes sense, right? More water means the paint stays wet longer. But 
with a thicker brush, you can load it up with enough paint because of that full belly that your paint is gonna stay wet and you can still do things with it a lot longer. So again, less frustration. So thick brush, thick paint, thin brush, thin paint. And if you just stick to that, just in general, it'll probably help you reduce some of the frustration level with learning which brushes work best for your particular style of painting, your particular palette, your particular paint line or paint consistency that you like best. So let's talk about just general sizes. Obviously I talked about like the two, the, the zero, the one. You're gonna be pretty good with most brands in a two, zero, one. Uh, two is probably the biggest. Now when you get into more artist uh, line brushes, you may see things like this is an 18-0, but it's pretty big. Like things like this, be if you can get a dimensions measurement on the website you're looking at the brush on, like that's great because it'll actually tell you like how long the brush is. And otherwise though, with synthetics, I always try to buy in person. Um, with miniatures, brushes, uh, brands that we all know, Da Vinci is one, Reaper has a Kalinske line, um, Escoda is one. Uh, Raphael and Da Vinci. Da Vinci is my favorite. Raphael is probably my second favorite. Windsor and Newton series seven is another one. All those brushes, if you choose a size zero, you're going to be pretty good. On the other hand, if you go down to a size double zero, triple zero, that's about the lowest I would go. The Reaper line in particular is kind of silly with sizing. It goes from a zero to an aught five. Um, and the Aught 5 and Aught 10 on the, the Reaper line are actually good brushes. They're like kind of workhorse brushes. Uh, the Reaper Aught 10 is close to Tiny Brush here, which is a triple zero in Da Vinci. So you can always get on your favorite miniature painting board or website or Discord and say, hey guys, I'm looking to order a Raphael. What sizes are most useful for miniatures? I'm painting 28 millimeter. And you'll get all sorts of people like chiming in. Okay. Let's talk really quick about cleaning, cleaning and rinsing. So keep your paint water fairly clean. If it gets a bit dirty and mucky, you're okay. But if it's really mucky, like you haven't washed it for like a week and you paint every day, be aware that that's going to be getting particulate matter right up into your ferrule and it will build up over time. Um, so maybe you want to rinse out. I always rinse my, brush, my uh, paint water at least once a day. Um, you can use a brush cleaner. It's not absolutely necessary if you uh, if you do like rinse your brushes a lot. I rinse my brushes a lot while painting and I seldom need to clean. But if you do, you can use one of these cake soaps like uh, the Master's Brush Cleaner. And you just wet your brush and kind of move it around on the cake soap and you get a little bit of soap in your brush and then you can rinse it out. And if you want, you can uh, put some conditioner in it, although technically this is a preserver, so this one does have a little bit of cleaner in it. A lot of people who use this will just get it on their brush and just shape their brush and leave it sit. And they'll just rinse it out next time they use their brush. Um, if you have a brush that's really compromised and you need to get, like, you're seeing a lot of paint in the ferrule, like a dark shadow right near the metal ferrule of the brush, then you know that that's paint buildup. That's absolutely glo globbed on pa dried paint. That master's brush cleaner isn't gonna do anything for that, but this stuff will. My bottle's deformed, it got left in a hot, uh, in a hot car. But it's uh, Windsor Newton Brush Cleaner and Restorer. It is non-hazardous, biodegradable, and non-toxic. Um, it is wonderful stuff. I usually put it in my ceramic palette. I just put a few drops in there, press the brush down into it, kind of like gently pushing it like this. Or if it's a round brush, I'll roll it back and forth through the uh, through the goo, and you'll start to see particulate matter come out. Once you see the particulate matter start to come out, just rub it off on a paper towel and then reload, rub off, reload, and do that again and again and keep adding drops if you need it until your paper towel is pretty much clean when you press the brush onto it and you can't see this dark shadow anymore. And then I would definitely condition. And when I say condition, yeah, you could use this stuff, but you could also just use a normal hair conditioner. I mean, like human hair conditioner. You are working with a natural hair brush. So normal conditioners will work quite fine as far as keeping it, like keeping the hairs moist and from being too dry. A dry hair is a brittle hair, and then your brush will start to lose a lot of hairs. That's uh, especially true if you're using sables for oil painting, do condition your brushes after you clean them um, because the solvents are going to dry out these hairs really fast.
All right, everybody. I hope this answers some of your questions about brushes. If you are a new person or if you just wanted a little extra explanation, thanks for tuning in. Remember that you can find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash painting big. I also stream on Twitch, on Reaper Miniatures Twitch, every weekday morning at 1130 a.m. USA Central Standard Time. All right. Thanks for tuning in, everybody, and I will be back at you next month. This is Anne signing off.